All right, time to hear the Clintons talk about the MAG-7. Another record closing high today. The mega caps already sitting on double digit gains and substantially so for the year. But can this narrow leadership continue to grind higher? Let's ask Doug Clinton of Deepwater Asset Management. Welcome, Doug. It's good to see you on this Friday. Likewise, Scott. Happy Friday. You too. Um, you know, I've run out of superlatives to describe what's what's happening. Some who are, are even positive and invested use the word insane for some of these mega cap gains. W what words would you use in and how do you feel about what you witnessed? Okay, hold your horses for just a flipping flapjacking moment, okay? Listen, you can describe the gains as insane, but don't describe the stocks as insane or the valuations as insane. Because that's where we have a big divergence in this market between valuations that, based upon growth rates, don't even look very expensive on several of those big mag sevens, right? Just because the stock prices have gone up a lot from the lows that they were back in 2022 when the market crashed and all those stocks fell 50, 60, 70% does not mean those stocks are now insanely valued. It's just been an insane move to the upside. And there's a big difference between that and people, people conflate the two. Well, when a trillion dollar market cap is up 50% in a month, I think that probably barely qualifies as insane. You know, we are big time tech investors. We have uh, a lot of love for the MAG-7. But I think as rational people too, we look at some of the moves we've seen over the past month, really the past eight weeks, and at some point, you know, these trillion dollar companies can't keep adding a couple hundred billion dollars to their market cap every single month. So my view is at some point we will get a break. We're sort of due for a breather. Maybe we're due for a little bit of a pullback. I don't know if that happens in a week or longer. Obviously, the market can be insane to the, the word of the moment here for longer than we think. Uh, but longer term, that's how we like to try to look at these stocks and not trade, try to play the short term trends. All of the MAG-7 continue to have really great optionality as it pertains to AI as an emerging technology. The problem is these stocks have a pullback and it gets bought up right away, right? Meta can pull back 3% in a day and then it's bought right up. And next thing you know, it's a new high. Same thing with NVIDIA. So they do have pullbacks. And, you know, stocks will go down for a day or two and, you know, draw down 3 4 5%. And then it's bought right back up. Why is it getting bought right back up, right? You've got to ask yourself that. Because the stocks are undervalued. Meta's still extremely undervalued. NVIDIA likely undervalued. That stock's fair value right now should likely be in the $1,000 to $1,500 range. You could push $2,000 on NVIDIA stock right now if they keep anywhere remotely close to these growth rates up over the next couple of years, okay? That's why these stocks are getting bought up every single dip. They're there to buy, right? Same exact thing with Amazon. Look at the bottom lines of these companies. They're increasing 100%, 200% year over year. You're going to pay a, a big price for that, right? You're willing to pay up quite substantially. And you can make an argument that they're not paying up enough. We think over the next several years, a lot of these companies will have benefits that will see flow through to earnings and I think can continue to support these stocks outperforming uh, some of their peers in the broader S&P. I don't know if this is just too much of the, a softball loaded question is to ask you which one of the group looks more insane than, than the others. And I only qualify my question saying, well, NVIDIA is like literally going to the moon every day. So maybe that's the easy choice. But is it necessarily? I don't think it's necessarily NVIDIA. I mean, the, the tough thing and again, the insane thing with NVIDIA is even though the stock is up 200 plus percent in a year, the multiple really hasn't expanded that much. So a lot of it has actually been supported by a very rapid increase in demand for their GPUs. All of the hyperscalers obviously are building out infrastructure to support their investment in AI. So I probably wouldn't say NVIDIA. Uh, I might give you a, a little bit of a divergent answer. I'll tell you the one that I'm actually the most frustrated with, mm -hmm. um, which maybe means it also to some uh, extent could be insane, but it's Google. I mean, we own it. We are shareholders in Google in our core Titan fund. And the thing that's super frustrating about them is the stock's up 50%. Why should we be upset with that? It's because they should be the leaders in AI and they just haven't been. You know, open AI, I think, is clearly two steps ahead of them for all the data that they have, 20 years of search data, for all the distribution they have, billions of users touch their products every single day. We think they should be in the lead in AI and they just haven't shown the hunger, they haven't shown the fire 
to really be aggressive going after AI. And we think that that could be a mistake. We'd like to see them get. Oh, gosh. OK, hold on. OK, and I'm not even a Google shareholder, but let me stick up for Google for a minute here. OK, listen, there's going to be a lot of different ways to play AI. OK, it's not just about a large language model and that's it. And whoever wins that wins the whole game. No. OK, AI is already playing a huge factor in terms of Google search, what Google's feeding you for news related things, how YouTube works in general, like Google is one of the best AI companies in the world, and that's nothing new to them, okay? And so if ChatGPT, let's say, is more successful when it comes to large language models, that does not mean Google failed. Ah, Google, you suck now. No, that's not the way this works. That's not the way this works at all. And also keep in mind, Google search wasn't the biggest search engine for a long time, okay? There was a long time period, and... I've been around on this planet for long enough to remember this. Some of you guys that might be older watching this right now, you remember what we used to use for search back in the day. Yahoo. Yahoo is what we used to use. And there was also another service that was pretty popular for a while called Ask Jeeves. Okay? I didn't even start using Google search till probably I got to college. Like when I got to college, like 08, 09, I think I started using Google search a little bit. And then I really started using it in 2010 and beyond, right? Until before that, it was like Yahoo Search was how I did it, or Ask Jeeves, right? And, and so, you know, you can't say, well, because this company's winning right now, they're going to win forever. It doesn't work like that also. So, I don't know, man. There's, there's a lot of factors at play here. And um, it cracks me up when people say, oh, this company is just like, you know, eh, there's so many beneficiaries in AI when you really look at it. I mean, you could go all the way down the list to the company, like the Palantirs. We could talk about AWS as a huge beneficiary. Google Cloud is going to be a huge beneficiary from AI. Microsoft's obviously been a big beneficiary. NVIDIA obviously is, right? AMD will be. I mean, there's, there's so many companies. Even you can take it to, to memory chip-related companies like a Micron. It's, it's a long list of companies that are going to be benefiting from AI. It's not just one one and Google lost and everybody else lost. A bit more aggressive with the products they're putting out. Does that, do you own it or not? We do own Google. We do. It's one, uh, again, as I say, uh, it's insane maybe to be frustrated when the stock's up so much. Mm -hmm. But as shareholders, we think there's more there. So I actually think it's insane that they haven't been more aggressive because I think that they're leaving a huge opportunity on the table. Meta um, is really the standout of, of this particular period just because their earnings report was going a lot so higher, amazing. Mister. And then the stock's reaction was just... I was like shocking to look at how, how much it was up coming off the best year ever last year. Of course, you, you own this stock. Do you like it the best in the group? Meta is our favorite in the group. I think that the year of efficiency that Zuckerberg undertook a little over a year now has really set a new tone at the company. And when we talk about AI, the pace of innovation here, it feels like every month it's like three years of development in the old world. I think that that year of efficiency has really set the tone at Meta in a way that Google has not figured out how to set the tone. One of the things that I think is actually very underappreciated with for Meta, and we've seen it to your point in the numbers in the last earnings, the thing that they still have that could be a huge business in the future is their open source model business. Right now they have the leading open source AI model in the world, that's Llama 2. I think it's downloaded something like 30 million times in the last couple of months. I believe that over time, Mark Zuckerberg is going to use the playbook he has always used with every product he's developed. You figure out how to get a billion users to use a product, and then you really figure out how to monetize it. So he talked about some of the, the tangential benefits they're seeing from Llama now in terms of interest from developers working with Meta improving their internal models but i think over the longer term we're going to see them provide some different services around llama that mm -hmm. could be a multi-billion dollar business for them maybe over the next two to five years yeah dude there's so many growth areas for meta it's ridiculous so um yeah that baby's on this way to 500 and then 550. next one up here you can still sink your teeth into the ai trend for the tape and then the best thing with meta the best thing with meta on top of the growth, all the growth opportunities, everything like that, is the fact that the company is trading at a forward P of like 23. <laughs> For their growth rates, it's like ridiculously low. Like, this is insane. Rally and risk. 
whether the latter is increasing as the S&P keeps rising and some big name stocks go parabolic. Let's ask Adam Parker. He is the founder and CEO of Trivariate Research, a CNBC contributor. Good to see you. Great to be here. Are you, do you marvel at this market like just about everybody else? I think the, the bull case we talked about, gross margins can go up for the average company. You'll think earnings are growing in the middle of this year, next year, and so forth, and that the Fed's likely to be accommodative. Um, that, that cocktail's still in place. I mean, valuations have moved a lot, but as you know, valuation is never a good predictor of near, near-term return. It's about believing the economy is going to be uh, in reasonably good shape, and I, I think the data points support that. So, so, so you think that yeah. you think that the the environment, all of the things that you said, plus you know other things you didn't mention that are potentially positive, support the stock market at these prices. As long as I think gross margins can go up and earnings are growing, I think history dictates being reasonably optimistic on equities is a good idea. And I can't find other asset classes that give me exposure to things like the top 20 U.S. equities. I mean, we, we talk about that all the time. The biggest 20 U.S. equities grow their net income at 15% per year. So what else do you see that that's awesome, that you can, that big and liquid and all that? So I think it's, it's, it's a good risk reward. What am I worried about? Maybe China gets worse. That's really hard to wrap your arms around. Maybe the U.S. consumer slows. We've seen a little discover, some little signs that the low end consumer is slowing. You got to monitor that. Um, I'm worried that, you know, that, that maybe you could. And the great thing for some of the strongest stocks out there, right? Some of the strongest stocks are certainly two stocks I own, right? Meta, Amazon, the number one and number three biggest position in the public account. Guess what they don't really have? China exposure. Amazon and, and Meta have such, I mean, Meta is almost no uh, China exposure, and Amazon's like almost nothing. It's like hardly anything, okay? So those companies, it doesn't really matter what's going on in China. NVIDIA now at this point in time is actually very little reliant on China at all now at this point in time, right? So, and those are, when you think about some of the strongest stocks in the market, you think about Meta, you think about Amazon, you think about NVIDIA. And so the whole negativity around China is just, it's not hitting those stocks because people are like, well, these companies don't really get any money from China anyways. Get the balance sheet stuff from the Fed, you know, kind of offsetting some of the accommodation. Of it. I mean, it's not, nothing ever feels, you always feel, as we talked about a million times, you always, always sound smarter when you're bearish. But I think True. if you think margins are going True. up, you should stay optimistic. And I see so many things I want to buy in the equity market underneath. Really? Yeah. Well, we'll get to that in a minute. Yeah. Um, um, before before we go underneath, I want to I want to stay above. Okay, so to speak. <laughs> Let's cruise, um, cruise at altitude. The, the two E's: exuberance yeah. and euphoria. Yeah. Uh, you worried about either of those? Look, I'll, what I do all day long is I talk to uh, portfolio managers and CIOs and 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 big you know uh, senior people at corporations. I don't see a lot of uh, um, you know champagne and Maybox or whatever you want to call it. I, I think people are you so, looking around uh, Nvidia's corporate headquarters. Yeah, uh, well, there's some Maybox in, yeah, the, uh, I think, I think AI, in the corporate parking I, lot there. I, I think, yeah, I think you picked, uh, you know, a stock <laughs> that's been, uh, you know, a monster. And, you know, we've talked about it a lot on your show that um, you need exposure to AI. If you're a fund manager and your, your boss says to you five years from now, what did you own for exposure to AI? And your answer is zero. You're fired. So you have to look that's around at the nine point. or ten businesses that participate. We're in the first inning of a of a multi-year trend, and they're they're a winner. Is all everyone thinks that they're the genius that's going to call the the right part of that lightning bolt. They think today is the first part of lightning bolt to sell it, and the, that stock's proven no wrong. Like that's an early trend. So I, I'm not smart enough to get that right. I just know we're headed. We, we talk no, about but, it. But you know, but you, you're a former chip analyst. Yeah. I mean, you you know chips better than most people. Yeah. And uh, somebody else used the inning analogy with me earlier saying yeah. this first inning of AI. I said, well, if you look at NVIDIA, they're doing like nine innings worth of gains in the first <laughs> inning. Yeah. You can't keep that pace up. No, you can't You can't keep the pace up for sure uh, in terms of the amount. But when I look at it, and we did a big note on it today, actually, like when is the time to toggle to the industrial-centric semis from the AI-centric semis? That, that's the title of our note today. Like the NXPs yeah, and the ADI Texans coming up, Texan, microchip. Semis. Yeah, great businesses. They all guide it down. They all have way too much inventory. They have more broad-based economic exposure and don't have a lot of AI. You know, it's hard to own them when I don't think gross margins can go up and they have a lot of inventory. What I could still sink my teeth into this AI trend for the time being. I think at some point you'll want exposure to them too. They're good businesses. I just think it's it's too early. So, I, I, look, our call coming in the year was to like uh, you know software that is accelerating growth and to like AI-centric semis, avoid the industrials. I think that's still right. Um, I do worry about the EV to gross profit or the valuation, but I know that's not the leading variable I can use to pick stock. So last year I told everybody be very, very careful. Very careful. And what did I say be very careful of? 
all these people that wanted to short NVIDIA stock and try to bet against this one and all oh, the numbers aren't going to keep going up and those sorts of things. So be very careful, okay? They just started this new chip cycle in regards to AI chips, right? And it just started to hit, obviously, in the back half of 2023 and obviously it's going to hit in 2024 in a massive way. And the thing I told folks is usually these chip cycles, whenever NVIDIA goes on one of these big chip cycle bull runs, it usually lasts two to three years. Two to three years! So let's say we started last year, we're, this is probably going to continue on for at least this year and probably into 2025. And so at some point in time, maybe NVIDIA will be uh, an attractive uh, stock to buy some puts on. But you could be waiting until 2025 or 2026 for that opportunity, right? Because usually when you get one of these big cycles in NVIDIA, it's multi-years. And so you're just, you're waiting around for a bit. <laughs> and by that time, your puts already expired worthless, so you lost unlimited amounts of money on your, your short position if you got a short there. So you got to be careful there, guys, okay? Next up here, top stock pick in the Magnificent 7 is Meta. Microsoft. By the way, uh, they call it, they're starting to call it the Mag 5, I noticed. They're kinda, they kicked uh, Tesla out, and then they just kicked uh, Apple out. So now it's going to move to the Mag 5. Um, Microsoft obviously having a huge run since Satya Nadella took off, but more recently launching Azure OpenAI. And if you look in the earnings report, I thought this was interesting. They say they have 53,000 open uh, Azure OpenAI customers, half of the Fortune 500, according to them, including some big names like a, like a, a Coca-Cola and a Walmart. What does that tell to you about when it, uh, the cloud computing race and just the battle between Google, uh, Microsoft, and Amazon? Yeah, sure. So one of the first things that jumps out to me when we, when we talk about this side of things is this revenue is incredibly reliable, right? Not only because of the nature of the service being provided, you know, the incredibly high barriers to entry in terms of getting this kind of technology off the ground anyway means that there are so few companies that is, with a seat at this table and um, that you're already kind of onto a bit of a winner. But the, the caliber of customer as well, as you're just alluding to there, tells me that actually this revenue is, is, is pretty sticky. Um, now, in terms of more direct competitors, um, it's really a lot of this is more kind of the, the Microsoft versus Amazon race um, for this particular corner of, of, of the market. Um, and we know the regulators have already been looking into this, you know, these accusations of monopoly, things, things like that. But right. frankly, at the moment, um, absolutely market dominance. I mean, it, it certainly seems so. When you say half the Fortune 500 and some big names like a, a Walmart and a Coca-Cola, so certainly some blue chip names there. Um, I want to come over to Meta. Obviously, Meta had such a huge week, turned 20, so it can almost go to the bar and drink now. Um, <laughs> how meaningful is instating its first dividend and also that $50 billion share buyback? I mean, that's an incredible shareholder return. Yeah, absolutely. So in terms of the the scope of the reaction to this, there's a couple of reasons. One of them is that one of the criticisms levied at tech stocks, right, is that, you know, they've got these billions and billions languishing on the balance sheets. And you're saying, well, actually, you could be putting that to better use. And one way to do that is to actually pay investors for their patience. And um, particularly when you look at Meta, who have been the victim of some criticism in, in recent years in terms of maybe a slight lack of clarity when it comes to strategy, and they were sorely punished for that. Um, so investors are very happy that they're, they are getting rewarded for their patience, essentially. Um, and it does kind of change slightly the categorization of the stock. You know, you can start saying this has uh, got some income potential. Um, but looking looking more broadly, it's still very much a, a growth name. Um, but yes, certainly this development was, was right. very much liked by the market, which is an understatement. Yeah, the rest of the report just pretty much blowout. But it really feels like investors, they kind of uh, were very happy about the dividend and, of course, the share buyback as well. All right, last but certainly not least, let's talk about Apple. Tim Cook says that Apple's spending... Tremendous time and effort on generative AI saying that something is coming. So what does this mean for the company overall? And maybe more importantly, what does it mean for the stock price between now and whenever this announcement happens? Yeah, sure. I mean, Apple's got a much more difficult task when it comes to capitalizing on, on AI. And the, the hardware space for it is very, very different to the technology um, drivers behind it. Um, now, Apple really, their strategy around this has been, I want to use the word woolly. It's not very clear cut. And that tells me that I personally think the share price is going to be in a bit of a holding pattern between now and when we get some, some more clarity on that. You know, for example, we know that the new headset's doing incredibly well, but that's not enough on its own to be changing um, changing the dial just yet. So there's a lot to, a lot to monitor, but certainly growth as as we all know, has been a lot less uh, spectacular. You know, we're looking at one, two percent revenue growth, which is right. realms away from from some of the other um, peers. So your words, woolly. I think I might use mysterious. Um, you're not. So you're <laughs> saying this this mystery around Apple 
Do you, you don't think it's going to be good for the stock? Because, I mean, how often does Tim Cook come out and say anything, pretty much about anything? I mean, to tease something coming up, a lot of people think the announcement might happen at the Worldwide Developers Conference in June. I mean, isn't that just exciting unto itself? It is indeed. Um, it, you know, I, I don't want to be unnecessarily negative, um, but for me, I'm a, I'm a big fan of um, kind of hardened proof and, and some fundamentals. And until you can kind of sink your teeth into exactly what is this, um, where is it being produced, what are the margins for it, um, is the consumer resilient enough to receive um, this kind of product that they're potentially about to launch, all those kinds of questions are, are unanswered for me. But it is definitely okay. exciting. It's just not guaranteed in my mind just yet. All right, one question you can answer. What's your, your top pick when it comes to Magnificent Seven? Oh, that's tough. I do have to say I've been particularly impressed uh, by, by Meta's turnaround and refocusing on the core business um, of, of recent times. It's taken me by surprise. Yeah, you know, obviously, um, by the way, I'm about to go live. Palantir earnings right now. Pin comment down there if you want to join me for that guy. Um, you know, obviously, Meta is my number one pick, right? You look at that stock, you look at the revenue growth and how much they accelerate it. Look at the bottom line and how ridiculous those numbers are they're putting up year over year, right? And then you, you, you go a step further. Now they got a dividend plus share buyback. Then you take it a step further and you say, okay, look at the forward P of the stock, still in the 20s. I mean, you know, for, uh, some, uh, for a company that's growing their bottom line by a couple hundred percent and growing their top line by 25%, you shouldn't be trading at a forward P in the 20s. You should be trading at a forward P, honestly, probably in the 50s or 60s or even above that, right? And so to be trading at where it's trading, it's still trading very cheap. So the stock is still very cheap. You know, if, if Meta stock was trading at 800 today, I'd feel very differently. I'd say, okay, Meta is very, very fairly valued. If Meta was trading at even 650, 700 right now, I'd say, okay, Meta is about where it should be roughly, right? Anywhere from 650 to 800, I'd say, you know, if Meta was trading at 1,000, I'd be saying Meta is probably a little overvalued here. Um, it, it would be a good time to take some profits, but it's just not even remotely close to that, right? I mean, we're over 50%, less than 1,000. So, you know, night and day difference there. All right, guys, appreciate you joining me. Thanks so much for being here. Much love. If you want to join me on Twitch for the Palantir's earnings and conference call live, pin comment down there. Much love and have a great day.